Evening, everybody, and welcome to Serial Killers. My name is Jill Salazzo. I am one of the reference librarians here at East Hampton Library. Uh, once upon a time, I had the idea to go into forensic anthropology, a field that at times would have brought me into the world of serial killers, but I ultimately decided against it. And until the term serial killer gained notoriety, these people were simply monsters. The killers society first understood as werewolves, vampires, ghouls and witches, or later on Hitchcockian psychos. So I'm gonna share my screen with everybody so we can get started. Everybody, I actually have a, a presentation screen up so I won't be able to see any questions, but I will be able to take questions at the end of the program. Um, and you can type them in the chat or wait until we are done with the presentation uh, when I come back um, onto the full screen. So before we look at our list of uh, serial killers, I'll give you some idea of what is factored into giving someone that title. Today, the term serial killer is as common as the word Kleenex, but it wasn't always that way. So here you see a list of some of the terms that were previously used to describe this style of murder. Uh, there's stranger on stranger murder, recreational killing, thrill killing, psycho murder, motiveless murder, spree killing, and believe it or not, mass murder, which today is a term that means something different. The idea of serial killers in pop culture came from movies and subsequently plays and books before that, like Psycho, Frenzy, Dirty Harry, 10 Rillington Place, Deranged, Maniac, and Terror Train, many of which were inspired by actual cases. These killers were perceived as madmen in civil terms or as inexplicable monsters like the supernaturally invincible Jason Voorhees from the Friday the 13th movies or Michael Myers from the Halloween series. There is no single source of who coined the term serial killer, but many believe it was likely coined by FBI agent and behavior sciences profiler, Robert K. Ressler. Ressler likened these types of killings to the serial adventure films shown on Saturday afternoons in the 30s and 40s. As Peter Vronsky writes, Quote, audiences were lured back to movie theaters week after week by the inconclusive ending of each episode, the so-called cliffhanger. Instead of providing a satisfying conclusion, these endings increased the tension in the audience. Likewise, Ressler felt after every murder, serial killers experience a cliffhanging tension and a desire to commit a more perfect murder than before, end quote. So the FBI definition of a serial killer is as follows. A series of three or more killings, not less than one of which was committed within the United States, having common characteristics such as to suggest the reasonable possibility that the crimes were committed by the same actor or actors. In 2005, this was revised to reduce the number of victims from a minimum of three to two. Most of these killers also had a so-called cooling off period between their murders. This is important to the definition because this distinguishes a serial killer from a mass murderer who would kill a number of victims in one incident. So what makes a serial killer a serial killer? And that's one of the oldest questions in criminology and for that matter, philosophy, law, theology is whether criminals are born or made. Are serial killers a product of nature, i.e. genetics, or nurture environmental factors? And perhaps it's not that serial killers are made, but that the majority of us are unmade by good parenting and socialization. What remains behind is these unfully socialized beings with this capacity to attack and kill. And often that capacity is grafted onto a sexual impulse aggression sexualized at puberty. Many sex serial killers are survivors of early childhood trauma of some kind, physical or sexual abuse, family dysfunction, emotionally distant or absent parents. Trauma is the single recurring theme in the biographies of most killers. 
And while it's true that almost all serial killers suffered some sort of childhood trauma, there is a problem with this as the sole cause of their psychopathology. If 100 kids grow up in an abusive foster home and one turns out to be a serial killer, what about the other 99? They grew up to be, well, maybe not as well-adjusted citizens, but certainly not serial killers. What is the missing X factor? Some say it's that serial killers choose to act on the compulsion to kill. During the first big wave of celebrity serial killers in the 1960s and 70s, some defense lawyers tried to argue in court that serial killers are not guilty by reason of insanity because an irresistible compulsion to kill is a form of temporary insanity. The legal definition definition of insanity is an inability to distinguish right from wrong and an inability to understand the consequences of an action. But serial killers are very aware of what they're doing. That's why they disguise themselves, why they hide evidence, and why they leave the scene of the crime. One can make the argument that serial killers suffer from psychopathy, that because they are psychopaths, they have no sense of remorse or empathy and their decision-making process is faulty. Interestingly, however, not all serial killers are psychopaths according to the hair test, which is a psychiatric diagnostic, or at least don't test as such. So without further ado, let's take a look at some of the notorious serial killers in history. But first, I just wanted to show this little meme, which shows serial killers in movies with the mask and the chainsaw, and then serial killers in real life, which basically look like everybody else. So first up on our list is probably one of the most famous serial killers and also most famous for never being identified, and that's Jack the Ripper. The killer given the nickname of Jack the Ripper operated around the Whitechapel district in the East End of London in 1888. In both criminal case files and contemporary journalistic accounts, he was referred as the Whitechapel murderer and the leather apron. The attacks ascribed to Jack the Ripper typically involved female prostitutes. Their throats were cut prior to abdominal mutilations. The removal of internal organs from at least three of the victims victims led to ideas that the killer had at least some anatomical or surgical knowledge. All in all, there were 11 brutal murders committed between 1888 and 1891, known collectively as the Whitechapel murders, though only five are considered the most likely to be linked to Jack the Ripper. Known as the canonical five, these women were Marianne Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes, and Mary Jane Kelly, four of which are featured in the pictures. These are autopsy photos um, of the women. Uh, the fifth was too uh, gruesome to actually picture in this um, presentation. Each of the canonical five murders were perpetuated at night, on or close to a weekend, either at the end of a month or a week or so after. The mutilations became increasingly severe as the series of murders progressed, except for that of Stride, whose attacker may have been interrupted. Nichols was not missing any organs. Chapman's uterus and sections of her bladder and genitals were taken. Eddowes had her uterus and left kidney removed and her face mutilated. And Kelly's body was eviscerated with her face gashed in all directions. Her abdomen was emptied of almost all of its organs. Many of them were placed around her and the crime scene with her heart missing from the crime scene altogether. And like I said, these are four of the five canonical um, women attributed to Jack the Ripper. Uh, again, Mary Jane Kelly was too graphic to show. The vast majority of the City of London police files relating to their investigation into the Whitechapel murders was actually destroyed in the Blitz. The surviving Metro police files offer a detailed view into investigative procedures during the Victorian era. More than 2,000 people were interviewed, 
upwards of 300 were investigated and 80 people were detained. A reward of 500 pounds was offered for the arrest of the Ripper. Butchers, slaughterers, surgeons, and physicians were suspected most. During this time, a number of letters were received by the police, with many claiming to be from Jack the Ripper. Um, one such letter, known as the Dear Boss Letter, was even signed Jack the Ripper, but most of these letters were considered to be hoaxes from journalists to boost paper sales. It's believed that the murders ended due to either the murderer's death, imprisonment, institutionalization, or immigration. To this day, his identity remains a mystery. So Jack the Ripper was generally believed to be well-dressed and a gentleman of the time would have worn a top hat and cape. And he's been well represented through pop culture throughout the years. Um, so works of literature featuring the Ripper began as early as 1888 when the murders were being committed. A number of plays, musicals, and operas have been adapted based on the persona. He was actually the inspiration for Sweeney Todd. Numerous films have been made around the Whitechapel murders and Jack the Ripper, most recently in 2016. And the idea of Jack the Ripper is seen as the universal force of evil in television, and the character has been used to fill many villainous roles. He's also been prominent in works of art, most notably Jack the Ripper's Bedroom by English artist Walter Sickert and the graphic novel From Hell, which was also adapted into a movie. Jack the Ripper has been featured as a subject in music by artists ranging from metal bands to Bob Dylan, and he's a character in at least 21 video games. An independent minor league baseball team in London, Ontario, named themselves the London Rippers and used the classic image of a man in a top hat and cape as their mascot. To my knowledge, I believe they have since changed that. Next on our list, um, if you are a fan of Netflix, you've probably seen um, a recent show on him, is Jeffrey Dahmer, uh, also known as the Milwaukee Cannibal or Monster. Jeffrey Dahmer was born in 1960 in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. He grew up in a complete family unit. However, his father was away a lot with school and work and his mother had depression and was a hypochondriac who often was on a cocktail of drugs. As a boy, he took an interest in dead animals and would collect them, storing them in formaldehyde. His dad was a chemist and later dissecting them. By the time he reached high school, he was seen as an outcast and began drinking alcohol during the day, telling a classmate it was his medicine. Although quiet, he was seen by staff as polite and highly intelligent. And as a side note to this, I can share a story. My high school French teacher taught German at a high school in Ohio in the 1970s. And she remarked that she had such a lovely young man as a student by the name of Jeffrey Dahmer. She remarked that she always found him to be pleasant and never noticed anything odd or off about him. Around the time he was in high school, Dahmer realized he was gay and would have fantasies about controlling a male partner. These fantasies eventually evolved and intertwined with his views on dissection. In 1977, his parents divorced and his dad moved out. He graduated high school and shortly before that, his mom and younger brother moved out to live with family, leaving 18-year-old Jeffrey on his own. Three weeks after graduating, Dahmer committed his first murder, a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks. In 1979, on his father's urging, Dahmer actually joined the army and served as a combat medic. Due to his alcohol abuse, he was deemed unsuitable for military service and honorably discharged, as his superiors did not believe any problems Dahmer had in the army would be applicable to his civilian life. After returning to Ohio, his alcohol abuse caused more problems, and his father ended up sending him to live with his grandmother in Wisconsin. Trouble followed him there with several arrests under his belt. In 
And around this time, he also started frequenting gay bars, bathhouses, and bookstores where he would meet partners, but would become frustrated if they moved during the act. In November of 1987, Dahmer committed his second murder and afterwards began to actively seek victims, taking care to dismember the bodies, stripping the flesh, and putting the bones in acid and bleach to preserve the skeletons. He began to consume his victims around 1990. By 1991, fellow residents of the apartment complex where he lived repeatedly complained of smells emanating from his apartment, in addition to sounds of falling objects and the occasional sounds of a chainsaw. Dahmer claimed his freezer died and his food became spoiled. In May of 1991, Dahmer lured a 14-year-old boy into his apartment where he drugged him and drilled a hole in his skull to inject hydrochloric acid to make the boy submissive. In the early hours of the next morning, the, the boy was discovered on the street by three women who called the police. Dahmer arrived as well, but the women wouldn't let him leave with the boy. Dahmer convinced the police that the boy was his boyfriend and they had a fight. Police accompanied them back, did a quick search of the, of the apartment, and reported it as a domestic dispute. Dahmer said the police officers told him to take good care of his boyfriend. And after they left, Dahmer killed him. In July of 1991, Jeffrey lured a man named Tracy Edwards into his apartment with $100 to pose for nude photographs, drink beer, and keep him company. Edwards managed to get out of the apartment after Dahmer attempted to handcuff him, and Edwards flagged down two police officers to help him remove the handcuffs. The officers detained Dahmer upon discovering Polaroids of dismembered bodies. A more detailed search of the apartment found four severed heads, seven skulls, some of them painted and some bleached, two human hearts, and an entire torso in his freezer, among many other atrocities. A total of 74 Polaroids detailing the dismemberments were found. Altogether, Dahmer confessed to the murder of 17 men and boys, but some believe the number to be much higher. He was convicted and sent to prison for life and was eventually killed by another inmate in 1994. The apartments where he committed most of the murders were demolished in 1992, and today it remains a vacant law. His victims ranged in age from 14 to 32. John Wayne Gacy was born in March of 1942 in Chicago, Illinois. He was the second child and only son. Gacy as a child was close to his mom and two sisters, but endured a difficult relationship with his father who was an alcoholic and physically abusive to his family. He was frequently the focus of his father's abuse and it was noted that he never fought back. He started working for a shoe company that transferred him to Springfield, Illinois, and eventually got married and had children. He was by all means successful as a manager of a KFC owned by his in-laws. During this time, he opened a club in his basement where his employees could drink alcohol and play pool. Mostly teenagers, Gacy would only socialize with the young men. He would make advances, and if they rebuffed him, would claim his advances were jokes or a test of morals. He would make, uh, at the time, he would lure young teenage boys to his home, telling them he was commissioned to conduct homosexual experiments in the interest of scientific research. He assaulted the 15-year-old son of a co-worker and was subsequently convicted and sentenced to 10 years in prison. His wife filed for divorce the same day he was sentenced. He never saw his wife or children again. Not long after his release, he served 18 months of his 10-year sentence. He was charged with assaulting a teenage boy. However, the Iowa Parole Board didn't learn of these charges and his parole ended eight months later. He married for a second time and his new wife and her two daughters moved into his home outside of Chicago. He and wife number two divorced a few years later after she learned of his bisexuality and discovered that he had been bringing teenage boys into his garage and kept gay pornography and a collection of men's wallets and IDs. At the same time, he established a part-time construction business and worked as a clown 
for local parties, events, etc. During this time, Gacy murdered 33 young men and boys and buried 26 of them in the crawl space of his house. They included both random strangers and people he knew. Inside his home, he would lure them in with drinks, drugs, or by gaining their trust. He would produce a pair of handcuffs under the guise of showing a magic trick. He would handcuff himself behind the back and release with the key he was holding. He would then show them, but would say, the trick is you have to have the key. He would then rape and torture his victims and eventually strangle them. Most would be left under his bed for up to 24 hours before he buried them in the crawl space. In 1978, a missing persons report was filed for Robert Peast. Police, upon looking into Gacy's background, conducted search warrants, finding many questionable things, and surveillance. Gacy actually invited detectives to a restaurant where he talked about his life and remarked, quote, you know, clowns can get away with murder, end quote. A second search warrant was executed where police discovered a smell similar to rotting bodies coming from the crawl space. The next day, Gacy drove to his lawyer's office where he gave a long rambling confession of the murders. After falling asleep due to intoxication, he left to attend to his business needs. Upon execution of the second warrant, the bodies were discovered and Gacy was arrested. Prior to his trial for the murder of 33 men and boys, he underwent a year of psychological testing where he tried to convince the doctors he was suffering from multiple personality disorder. He pled guilty by reason of insanity and his lawyers attempted to use that as his defense. The jury deliberated for less than two hours and found Gacy guilty on all 33 counts. He was sentenced to death and was executed by lethal injection on May 9th, 1994. This is H.H. H. Holmes and he was born in May of 1861 in New Hampshire under the name Herman Webster Mudgett. It's widely considered that he had an average childhood for the time. At the age of 16, he graduated from Phillips Exeter Academy. And a year later, at the age of 17, he married Clara Loverling, who gave birth to their son two years after that. In 1882, at the age of 21, he decided to enroll, enroll at the University of Michigan's Department of Medicine and Surgery, where it said he engaged in facilitating grave robbing to supply medical cadavers. Two years later, Clara left him after it was said he treated her violently. In 1886, he married Myrta Belknap, while still technically married to Clara, and had a daughter with her in 1889. Years later, in 1894, he married Georgiana Yoke, while still married to both Myrta and Clara. In August of 1886, he arrived in Chicago and got a job at a drugstore, adopting the moniker H.H. H. Holmes. The following year, he began construction on a mixed-use building, a portion of which he intended to be a hotel for the upcoming World's Fair in Chicago. In stories and news, this became his murder castle. In actuality, it's believed he knew all of his victims and didn't in fact lure strangers from the fair. And for those who watch television, a season of American horror, stor horror story subtitled Hotel took inspiration from the stories of H.H. H. Holmes. Press alleged the structure had secret torture chambers, had trapdoors, gas chambers, and a basement crematorium, but none of these claims have ever been validated. Others claim the hotel was laid out like a maze with doors opening into brick walls windowless rooms, and dead-end staircases. <coughs> Excuse me. The majority of Holmes's victims were people, most unknowingly, brought in to be a part of one of his scams and then disposed when they were no longer needed. Excuse me, one moment. Others were women who he got pregnant and were victims of failed abortions performed by Holmes himself. He was finally arrested in 1894 after a scam that involved killing his partner, Benjamin Pedizel, 
who is described as Holmes's tool or his creature for insurance money. He then convinced Pitazel's widow to turn over custody of three of her children to him, and he subsequently killed them all. He was arrested by the Pinkerton Agency on an outstanding warrant for, of all things, horse theft. During his trial for the murder of Benjamin Pitazel, Holmes eventually confessed to murdering 27 people and attempting murder on six others. Most of his confession was nonsense, as some of the people he claimed to have killed were in fact still alive. Altogether, while he confessed to 27 murders, he only has the one confirmed kill of Benjamin Pitazel and is only suspected of nine others. However, the true number is not known, but some believe that the number could be as high as 200. He was hanged and asked to be buried in cement so his body wouldn't be dug up by grave robbers. The murder castle was eventually torn down in 1938 and a United States post office now sits on the lot. In 2017, amid allegations Holmes escaped execution, his body was exhumed. This came in part from a story told by his great, great, great grandson who believed that he was not hanged and buried and that he could have in fact also been the notorious killer Jack the Ripper. This claim came from stories written in Holmes's journals where he detailed killing prostitutes in London in 1888. Because he was buried in cement, his body did not decompose normally, his clothes were almost perfectly preserved, and his mustache was intact. Dental testing confirmed it was Holmes, and he was reburied. So up next, we have Ted Bundy. Ted Bundy was born Theodore Robert Cowell in November of 1946 at the Elizabeth Lund Home for Unwed Mothers in Burlington, Vermont. For the first few years of his life, he lived with his maternal grandparents and was actually told that they were his parents and his mother was his sister. This was something he later said he resented her for. After a few years of living under what many described as an abusive environment, Ted's mother took him to live with cousins in Washington. A year later, his mother Louise married Johnny Culpepper Bundy, who formally adopted Ted. Louise and Johnny would go on to have four more children together. Ted, however, never connected with his stepfather, but by all accounts, he had an otherwise normal childhood with them. During college at the University of Washington, he started dating Stephanie Brooks, but she broke up with him a year later, citing his immaturity and lack of ambition. Many psychologists believe this to be a pivotal time in his development. In mid-1970, and now a psychology major at the University of Washington, Ted took a job at the Seattle Suicide Hotline Crisis Center. He eventually got into law school and reconnected with Stephanie Brooks, even referring to her once as his fiance. In January of 1974, he abruptly cut off all contact with Brooks, many say as vengeance for the earlier breakup. And by April, he stopped going to law school just as young women, st women started disappearing in the Pacific Northwest. During 1974, young women, mostly college students, started disappearing at a rate of about one per month. Investigators grew concerned as there was little physical evidence and the only thing they had in common was their appearance. They were all young, attractive, white college students with hair parted down the middle. During this period, Bundy worked as the assistant director of the Seattle Crime Prevention Advisory Committee, where he wrote a pamphlet for women on rape prevention. He then went on to work at the Department of Emergency Services, the department that was actually helping in the search for the missing women. He began dating a woman named Carol Ann Boone at this time. And at the same time, minor clues started being put together about the disappearances. They all took place at night, usually near construction work, and were within a week of midterm or final exams. All of the victims were wearing pants, and at many crime scenes, people described sightings of a man wearing a cast or sling and driving a brown or tan VW Beetle. After the July daylight abduction of two women at the beach with witnesses, investigators were able to put together a profile and a number of people who used to work with Bundy reported him as a suspect 
but detectives didn't think it was likely to be him. In August of 1974, he received a second acceptance to law school at the University of Utah, and the pattern began again. A girlfriend in Washington actually reported him to police on three separate occasions as a suspect in the disappearances in both Washington and Utah. By 1975, Bundy was arrested in Utah after fleeing from police, but was later released. He was put under surveillance and a month later sold his VW bug, which was impounded. Hair samples for some of the missing women were found inside the car. <clears throat> he was put in a lineup and immediately identified. He was convicted and sentenced for the kidnapping of a woman who got away, as well as murder, and sent to prison. He would actually go on to escape from prison, not once, but twice in the span of six months. He eventually ended up in Florida, where he again began attacking college-aged women, breaking into a sorority house to brazenly attack multiple women. He was arrested just a month later and eventually was convicted and sentenced to three death sentences. During the time between sentencing and execution, he began to talk, confessing to the murders in multiple states. Altogether, he confessed to 30 murders in seven states between 1974 and 1978, but many believe that number to be significantly higher. He was regarded as charismatic and handsome, traits that he exploited to win the trust of his victims and society as a whole. He typically approached victims in public, either feigning a physical injury or impersonating an authority figure before bludgeoning them into unconsciousness and taking them to secondary locations to be raped and strangled. He often revisited his victims, grooming and performing sexual acts with the corpses until decomposition made it impossible. He decapitated at least 12 of his victims and kept their severed heads as mementos in his apartment. And on January 24th, 1989, Ted Bundy was executed by electric chair. Next, we have Ed Gein. And Ed Gein was born in 1906 in Wisconsin, where he lived with his mother, father, and older brother. His father was an alcoholic, unable to keep a job, and his mother was a deeply religious woman who believed women were promiscuous and instruments of the devil. They lived on a 155-acre farm, and Ed only left to go to school, where he was a good student with strange mannerisms who didn't have friends. In 1940, his father died of heart failure caused by alcoholism at the age of 66. Both sons became handymen around town, and Henry, the older brother, became concerned about Ed's attachment to their mother. In 1944, while burning vegetation on the property, a fire grew out of control and Ed reported his brother missing. His body was found face down and it said that cause of death was reported as heart failure, although it was also reported that he had bruises on his head. One year later, Ed's mother died after complications from several strokes. Gein retreated to a small room in his family home and began reading pulp magazines, which were inexpensive fiction magazines and adventure stories, particularly, particularly involving cannibals or Nazi atrocities. On the morning of November 16, 1957, Plainfield hardware store owner Bernice Warden disappeared. Her son reported that Gein was her last customer. Deputies searched the Gein farm and arrested him. Police discovered Warden's de decapitated body hung upside down by her legs with mutations made after her death. Police searching the property discovered a number of atrocities, including whole human bones and fragments, a wastebasket made of human skin, human skin covering several chair seats, skulls on his bedposts, female skulls with the top sawn off, bowls made from human skulls, a corset made from a female torso skinned from shoulders to waist, leggings made from human leg skin, masks made from the skin of female heads, a face mask from Mary Hogan, who was a saloon keeper Gein had previously killed in a paper bag and her skull in a box, 
Bernice Warden's entire head in a burlap sack and her heart in a plastic bag. A belt made from female human nipples, a pair of lips on a window shade drawstring, a lampshade made from the skin of a human face, and unbelievably more. During investigations, it was determined Gein was making a woman suit made of human skin and admitted to shooting Mary Hogan. He was also considered a suspect in several other unsolved cases in Wisconsin. At his arraignment, Gein pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. He was diagnosed with schizophrenia and deemed unfit to stand for trial. He was sent to the Central State Hospital for the criminally insane and later transferred to the Mendota State Hospital. Eleven years later, it was determined he could stand trial. He was found guilty and a second trial dealt with his sanity. He was again deemed insane and committed to Central State Hospital, where he spent the rest of his life until dying of lung cancer in 1984 at the age of 77. While the total number that he killed himself is unknow ultimately unknown, he gained notoriety after it was discovered he exhumed corpses from local graveyards for some of his trophies. And his story in particular has had a lasting effect on pop culture. He was the inspiration for myriad of fictional serial killers, including Norman Bates in Psycho, Leatherface in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, Buffalo Bill in The Silence of the Lambs, and the character of Dr. Oliver Threadson in America, American Horror Story Asylum. So this is Pedro Lopez, and he was born in October of 1948, the seventh of 13 siblings to a prostitute mother in Colombia. Young Pedro was a witness to much of his mother's activities, and it's said that those acts had a disturbing effect on his psychiatric health. He was evicted from the family home at the age of eight after being caught fondling his younger sister. He spent much of his early life committing small crimes and was eventually incarcerated for car theft. After being released, he began to murder young girls. He claimed that by 1978, he had killed over 100 girls before being caught and captured by members of an indigenous tribe. They were preparing to execute him when a U.S. missionary intervened and persuaded them to hand him over to police. Police quickly released him. He was again arrested in 1980 after a failed abduction, and he confessed to killing 200 young girls and up to 360 total. He led police to Ecuador to 53 graves. His victims were all girls between 9 and 12 years of age. He was released by the Ecuadorian government in 1994, then rearrested as an illegal immigrant and handed over to the Colombian authorities, <coughs> excuse me, who charged him with a 20-year-old murder. He was declared insane and held in the psychiatric wing of a Bogota hospital. In 1998, he was declared sane and released on $50 bail. A warrant for his arrest was issued from a fresh murder from 2002. And as of 2002, his whereabouts are unknown. Today, he would be 73 years old, and he's considered one of the serial killers throughout history with the highest body count. So this one's considered a little controversial, but I did include her. Uh, this is Elizabeth Bathory, and she was a Hungarian countess who lived from 1560 to 1614. She and four of her servants were accused of torturing and killing hundreds of girls and women between 1590 and 1610, a 20-year period. Her servants were put on trial and convicted, whereas she was confined to her home. She was born into the privileged noble Bathory family, and was endowed with wealth, education, and a promising social rank. She was married at the age of 15 to Count Ferenc Nadazdi, and it is said that they had eight children together. Rumors were rampant about the atrocities committed by Bathory and her servants between 1602 and 1604, and the investigation actually began. By 1610, 52 witness statements had been collected. By 1611, that number rose to 300. 
According to testimonies, her first victims were aged between 10 to 14 years. It is said she began killing daughters of the lesser gentry who were sent to her quarters by their parents to learn courtly etiquette. Needles were often mentioned as a device of torture. Some also described girls being burned with hot tongs and then placed in freezing cold water. Witnesses described seeing torture on dead bodies, some of which were buried in graveyards, others in unmarked locations. The highest number of victims cited during the trials was 650, but that claim has never been ver verified. It should also be noted that the witness statements and accounts are believed to be made more grandiose to make the whole story more macabre. Bathory was confined to her castle for the remainder of her life, where according to most sources, she was able to move freely throughout the castle, and she died at the age of 54. Probably the most famous and also most unproven rumor about her was that she killed young virgins to bathe in their blood to retain her youth and beauty, and that sadistic pleasure was considered her overall motive. Again, this was never proven. This is Richard Ramirez. Ricardo Richard Ramirez was born in El Paso, Texas in 1960, the youngest of five children. His father was an alcoholic who was prone to fits of anger that often resulted in violence being directed towards his wife and children in the form of physical abuse. Richard began smoking marijuana and drinking at the age of 10. He was very influenced by his older cousin, Mike, a decorated Green Beret combat veteran who himself had already become a serial killer and rapist during his time in the U.S. Army in the Vietnam War. Mike often boasted of his brutal war crimes and shared Polaroids with Richard, showing Vietnamese women whom he had raped, murdered, dismembered, and decapitated. Richard would later state he was fascinated by the images and stories. Mike taught Richard some of his skills, such as killing with stealth and effectively staying hidden in the dark. Richard was present when Mike fatally shot his wife, Jessie, in the face. He again said he was fascinated by this. After the shooting, Richard moved in with his sister and her husband, Roberto, an obsessive peeping Tom, who took Richard with him on his exploits. After Mike was released from the mental hospital, he joined them. By the time Richard was 14, he began using LSD and cultivating an interest in Satanism and the occult. As he grew into a young adult, his fantasies took on a more graphically violent nature. In 1982, at age 22, he moved to California, where he became addicted to cocaine and began committing burglaries to sustain his addiction. He would travel between LA and San Francisco at this time. Around June of 1984, he began the crimes that made him the Night Stalker. There was a pattern of breaking into homes and burglarizing them, but his methods of attack varied. He used handguns, knives, a machete, a tire iron, and a claw hammer. He would eventually be identified by a survivor and by fingerprints he left on a stolen vehicle. He was finally captured after, after a group of citizens recognized him, chased him down, and beat him. He was accused of killing over 15 people. He was convicted on all charges against him and sentenced to death by the gas chamber. Richard Ramirez died of complications from B-cell lymphoma in 2013. Gary Ridgway was born in 1949 in Salt Lake City, Utah, the second of three sons. Relatives described his home life as troubled with a domineering mother and several violent arguments between his parents. He was considered to have a low IQ and was dyslexic. He also had a bedwetting problem until he was 13, a problem that his mother addressed by washing his genitals after every episode. After graduating high school, Ridgway married his high school girlfriend, joined the US Navy and was sent to Vietnam. He apparently had sex with sex workers there and contracted gonorrhea. His first marriage ended after a year. He would be married and divorced a total of three times and had several girlfriends. During all of these relationships, he would frequently visit sex workers who he admitted to having a fixation on. He would complain about their presence while taking advantage of their services. 
Throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Ridgeway is believed to have murdered at least 71 teenage girls and women near Seattle and Tacoma, Washington, and that's 7171. He reported in court statements that he killed so many, he actually lost count. The majority of the murders occurred between 1982 and 1984. All were believed to be either sex workers or runaways. He would strangle most of his victims and dump their bodies in wooded areas around the Green River, which earned him his nickname. He was known to litter the dump sites with the materials belonging to others and even transported some victims to Oregon to confuse police. In the early 1980s, the King County Sheriff's Office formed a task force to investigate the murders. They consulted incarcerated killer Ted Bundy, who suggested that the killer revisited sites to have sex with his victims, which was true, and that if investigators found a fresh site, they should stake it out to catch him. Ridgway became a suspect in the killings in 1983, but he actually was not arrested until 2001. In 2003, Ridgway was sentenced to 48 life sentences without the possibility of parole, plus one more life sentence. He made a plea deal with investigators to provide them with location information for victims in exchange for no death penalty. And he's currently incarcerated at the Washington State Penitentiary. <clears throat> David Berkowitz was born in 1953 as Richard David Falco and was given away by his mother a few days after birth. Pearl and Nathan Berkowitz of the Bronx adopted him and switched his first and middle names. As a child, David was considered difficult, spoiled, and a bully. His adopted mother passed away when he was 14 and he had a strained relationship with his father's new wife. At the age of 17, David joined the army and served at Fort Knox and in South Korea. He was honorably discharged in 1974, and that same year he located his birth mother, Betty. He became very distraught after learning of the array of reluctant father figures Betty had for him while she was pregnant. This revelation is believed to have shuddered, shattered his sense of identity. In 1975, he bungled his first attempt at murder with a knife. He switched to a 44 caliber handgun and began a spree in the Bronx, Queens, and Brooklyn. He was purportedly attracted most to young female victims with long, dark, wavy hair. He sometimes attacked some of his victims while they sat with their boyfriends in parked cars. After two murders in 1977, he left a letter to the police in which he called himself the son of Sam and discussed his determination to continue his work and to taunt the police. In August of 1977, Berkowitz was spotted by a neighbor who said he was wielding a dark object in his hand. The neighbor contacted police four days later who searched cars in the area, including Berkowitz's yellow four-door Ford Galaxy. The next day, police investigating his car spotted a gun in the back seat, searched the car, and found ammunition, maps of the crime scenes, and a threatening letter to the lead investigator of the Omega Task Force. Police waited outside his apartment until he left and approached his car. Berkowitz reportedly remarked, quote, well, you got me, end quote. He quickly confessed to the shootings and expressed an interest in pleading guilty. During his confession, Berkowitz claimed his neighbor Sam's dog was possessed by an ancient demon that issued commands to kill people. He later said that this was a hoax, but then said he was part of a cult and that there were more Sams out there. Berkowitz was sentenced to 25 to life for each of the six murders to be served consecutively and was sent to Attica. He's currently incarcerated at Shawangunk Correctional Facility in Ulster County, New York. His most recent parole hearing was postponed in 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Hamilton Howard Albert Fish was born in Washington, D.C. in 1870. His father was 75 years old at the time of his birth, which was 43 years older than his mother, and passed when Albert was just five years old. His mother put him in an orphanage for five years where he endured physical abuse in the form of beatings, 
and verbal, being called Ham and Eggs after his birth name, Hamilton. His family had a history of mental illness. His uncle had mania, which was a manic disorder. A brother was confined to a mental hospital, and a sister was diagnosed with a mental affliction. Three other relatives were diagnosed with mental illnesses, and his mother had oral and or visual hallucinations. By the age of 20, he had arrived in New York City and claimed he became a prostitute and liked, liked to rape young boys. His mother arranged a marriage for him, and they actually ended up having six children together. He worked as a house painter, but said he continued molesting children, mostly young boys under the age of six. In 1917, after almost 20 years of marriage, his wife left him for a handyman boarding with them. He became a single father, and around this time, he started experiencing auditory hallucinations. He also began to indulge in self-harm mostly by embedding needles into his groin and abdomen. And the top right picture is actually an x-ray showing all those black lines are actually needles in his body. At the time of his arrest, he had at least 29 needles in his pelvic region. He also acquired a taste for cannibalism at this point. Fish believed God was commanding him to torture and sexually mutilate children. Many of the children he chose were either mentally disabled or African-American because, he's, as he explained, he assumed these people would not be missed when they were killed. He tortured, mutilated, and murdered young children with his implements of hell, which were a meat cleaver, a butcher knife, and a small handsaw. In May of 1928, he saw 10-year-old Grace Budd, and after convincing her parents to let Grace accompany him to his, quote, niece's birthday party, he, in fact, took her to an abandoned house where he killed her and ate her. In November of 1934, an anom anonymous letter was sent to Grace's parents, which ultimately led to Fish. In this letter, he described how he decided upon Grace and the circumstances under which he killed her in graphic detail. He figured, police figured out it was Fish from the envelope it was sent in, and he didn't deny murdering Grace at all. Two other murders were discovered after Fish's arrest, which he admit, admitted to. He pleaded insanity, but was ultimately found sane and guilty and was sentenced to death by electrocution. He had three confirmed victims and five others that were sus suspected, but as with many other killers, the true number of victims is unknown. Albert Fish was executed in the electric chair at Sing Sing Prison on January 16, 1936. So up next we have Dennis Rader, also known as the BTK killer. Dennis Rader was born in 1945, one of four boys. His parents worked long hours and Rader said he felt neglected, particularly by his mother. He exhibited zoo sadism at an early age by torturing, killing, and hanging small animals and would spy on female neighbors while wearing women's clothing. In 1971, Rader, after serving in the U.S. Air Force, married and had two kids. He became president of the church council and was a Cub Scout leader. In 1974, he killed four members of the Ortega family and actually wrote a letter detailing how he committed the crimes and stashed it inside an engineering book in the Wichita Public Library. Between 1974 and 1977, he had killed three more women. Around this time, he began sending letters to TV stations naming himself BTK for his method of killing, which was bind, torture, kill. His next victim wasn't until 1985. He killed a woman named Maureen Hedge and then took her body to his church, where he posed her in various bondage positions. His final victim was killed in 1991. By 2004, BTK was considered a cold case when he himself initiated a series of 11 communications with media. These included letters with clues to find memorabilia he kept from his kills, like the driver's licenses of his victims. He eventually sent info on a floppy disk to police, 
but unbeknownst to him, he had an old file from the church on there, which was last modified by him. After obtaining a sample of his daughter's DNA, they were able to confirm him as the killer when that sample was matched to one found under a victim's fingernails. He was arrested in 2005, driving near his home. When asked if he knew why he was going downtown, his reply was, quote, oh, I have my suspicions, end quote. Rader was charged with 10 counts of first-degree murder and found guilty on all charges. He currently serves 10 consecutive life sentences at the El Dorado Correctional Facility in Kansas. Rodney Alcala was born in 1943 to Mexican-American parents. He and his two sisters were raised by their mother in Los Angeles, California. In 1961, at the age of 17, Rodney joined the Army as a clerk, but was discharged three years later under medical grounds after being diagnosed with antisocial personality disorder. After leaving the Army, Alcala graduated from UCLA School of Fine Arts and later studied film under Roman Polanski at NYU. His first known committed crime was in September of 1968 when an eyewitness saw him lure an eight-year-old girl into his apartment. When police arrived, the girl was alive but found raped and beaten with a steel bar. Alcala fled the scene, left the state, and changed his name to John Berger, where he enrolled in NYU. In 1971, he obtained a job at a New Hampshire arts camp for children as a counselor. That same year, a 23-year-old flight attendant was found raped and strangled in her Manhattan apartment. That crime was solved and attributed to Alcala in 2011. In 1971, Alcala was added to the FBI's 10 most wanted fugitives list. Two campers from the camp recognized him and he was arrested and extradited to California. He was sentenced to three years for the case involving the eight-year-old girl and served 17 months. He was rearrested two months after his release for assaulting a 13-year-old girl and served two more years in prison. After his second release, his parole officer inexplicably allowed Alcala, a repeat offender and known flight risk, to travel to New York. It's believed that one week after arriving, he killed the daughter of the owner of the popular Hollywood nightclub, Ciro's. In 1978, he briefly worked for the LA Times as a typesetter and began convincing hundreds of young men and women that he was a professional fashion photographer. The picture at the bottom of the page is actually one of his. It's feared that some of the photographs he kept are actually some of his victims. In 1978, Alcala was a contestant on the show, The Dating Game. He won the competition and a date with the episode's bachelorette, but she refused to go out with him because she found him creepy. At the time, the technology didn't exist for background checks or national databases, so nobody who worked on the show was aware that Alcala had a criminal history by this point that included an attempted murder charge of an eight-year-old girl. His response on the show to what's your best time was the best time is at night and responded to another question that he was a banana and she should peel him. In hindsight, those answers elicit chills, but at the time of the show were considered fun. Many believe his rejection on the dating game was an exacerbating factor and that he killed at least three women after this. He was arrested and tried three times for the murder of a 12-year-old girl from Huntington Beach, California. The first verdict was overturned because jurors were improperly informed of his prior sex crimes. The second conviction was overturned because a statement made by a witness was found to be false. His third trial was in 2003. In preparing for his trial, prosecutors discovered four more victims that were linked to Alcala. For the third trial, Alcala acted as, as his own attorney. He took the stand in his own defense and asked himself questions. After two days of deliberation, he was convicted on five counts of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to death for a third time. In 2010, California and New York police departments released 120 of Alcala's photos in a bid to try and identify some. 
As of July of this year, 110 of those photos remain online. He was indicted or named as a suspect in 11, in 11 murders. Rodney Alcala died in prison in July of 2021. Eileen Wernos was born in February of 1956 to a 16-year-old mother and 20-year-old father. She never met her father as he was in jail when she was born for raping a seven-year-old girl. He committed suicide in prison. Her mother abandoned her and her older brother when Eileen was four, leaving them with their maternal grandparents. By 11, Eileen began exchanging sexual activities at school for cigarettes, drugs, and food. She claimed her grandfather sexually assaulted her and that she engaged in sexual activities with her brother. By age 14, she was pregnant by a friend of her grandfather's and gave birth to a boy who she gave up for adoption. At age 15, her grandfather kicked her out of the house and she began supporting herself through prostitution and living in the woods near her old home. She began a life of crime where she was arrested for a myriad of things in the following years, including DUI, disorderly conduct, firing a pistol from a moving vehicle, assault, disturbing the peace, and more. From the ages of 14 to 22, she attempted suicide at least six times. Around the age of 25, her crimes escalated. She was arrested for armed robbery, which came with a one-year prison term, forgery of checks, and theft of a revolver and ammunition. At age 30, Eileen met 24-year-old Tyria Moore, a hotel maid, and they moved in together. Eileen claimed it was love beyond imaginable. Together, the two were questioned for several assaults. From the period of November of 1989 to November of 1990, Eileen, sometimes with the aid of Tyria, shot and killed seven men. All of the men were between the ages of 40 and 65. Eileen claimed all of these men raped or attempted to rape her. In 1991, she was arrested on an outstanding warrant, although she was the prime suspect in these murders. Tyria was arrested the next day in Pennsylvania. She agreed to get a confession from Eileen in exchange for immunity. Three days later, Eileen confessed. In 1992, she went to trial for the murder of Richard Charles Mallory, who was the first man she killed, and was sentenced to death. In all, Wernos received six death sentences. She was executed by lethal injection in 2002. The 2003 film Monster, in which Char Charlize Theron portrayed Wernos was a biographical adapt uh, adaptation of her life. Charlize Theron would go on to win the Best Actress Oscar for her portrayal of Wernos. So next we're gonna quickly go through dishonorable mentions of some other serial killers. Um, the list could be very long and we could go on all night but I'm going to highlight a few more. This is Joel Rifkin. He was born to a young couple in 1959 and adopted to an upper middle class family on Long Island at just three weeks old. He was described as having poor social skills and learning disabilities that made him a loner. In 1989, shortly after his 30th birthday, he committed his first murder at his home. After killing the victim, he dismembered her and spread her body parts around the Northeast, including leaving her severed head in a paint can at the seventh hole of a golf course in Hopewell, New Jersey. From 1989 through 1993, it is believed that Rifkin murdered 16 more women. He was arrested in 1993 after New York State troopers pulled him over because of a missing license plate and discovered a dead body car covered by a tarp in the back of his pickup truck. He was sentenced to 203 years to life and is currently imprisoned at the Clinton Correctional Facility in New York. This is Joseph James D'Angelo, also known as the Golden State Killer. He was born in November of 1945 and was a, an American serial killer, serial rapist, burglar, and former police officer who committed at least 13 murders 
<clears throat> 51 rapes and 120 burglaries across California between 1974 and 1986. He is responsible for at least three separate crime sprees throughout the state, each of which spawned a different, different nickname in the press before it became evident that they were committed by the same person. He was known as the Vesalia Ransacker, the East Area Rapist, and the original Night Stalker. He's believed to have taunted and threatened both victims and police in obscene phone calls and possibly written communications. In 2001, DNA testing indicated that the East Area Rapist and the original Night Stalker were the same person. And in 2013, crime writer Michelle McNamara coined the nickname the Golden State Killer. On April 24, 2018, the state of California charged 72-year-old D'Angelo with eight counts of first-degree murder based upon DNA evidence. Investigators had identified members of D'Angelo's family through forensic genetic ge genealogy. He was sentenced to life imprisonment without the chance of parole and is currently at the California State Prison. This is Robert Hansen known as the Butcher Baker. He was born in Iowa in 1939. He was arrested for burning down a Pocahontas County Board of Education school bus garage, revenge for his unpopularity in high school. He served 20 months of a three-year prison sentence in Anamosa State Penitentiary. During his incarceration, he was diagnosed with manic depression with periodic schizophrenic episodes. The psychiatrist who made the diagnosis noted that Hansen had an infantile personality and was obsessed with getting back at people he felt had wronged him. In 1967, he moved to Anchorage, Alaska with his second wife, whom he had married in 1963 and with whom he had two children. Hansen is believed to have begun killing around 1972. His modus operandi was to pick up a prostitute in his car and force her at gunpoint to his home where he would rape her. He would then fly her out to a secluded area and hunt her as if she were wild game before shooting or stabbing her. He was eventually captured in 1983 after a search of his home and property turned up souvenirs from his victims. He was sentenced to 461 years in prison without the possibility of parole. He died in prison in 2014, age 75, from natural causes. These gentlemen are the Hillside Stranglers, Kenneth Bianchi and Angelo, Angelo Buono. In January of 1976, Kenneth Bianchi left Rochester, New York and moved to Los Angeles, California to live with his cousin, Angelo Buono Jr. Buono provided strong mo mo role model, excuse me, for the docile Bianchi. When Bianchi was short of money, Buono came up with the idea of getting some girls to work for them as prostitutes. They eventually bought a supposed trick list from prostitute Deborah Noble with names of men who frequented prostitutes. Noble and her friend Yolanda Washington delivered the list to the men. When it was discovered that Noble had deceived them, the men raped and killed Yolanda Washington out of rage. This pattern continued with nine more victims. Many of the victims' bodies were discovered in the hillsides around Los Angeles, leading to the media nickname. It was initially believed that only one person was responsible for the killings. The police, however, determined from the positions of the bodies that two criminals were working together, but withheld that information from the press. It was not until the deaths of five young women who were not sex workers, but girls who had been abducted from middle-class neighborhoods, that the media attention and subsequent hillside, hillside strangler moniker came to prominence. In January of 1979, after intensive investigation, police charged Bianchi and Buono with the crimes. Bianchi had fled to Bellingham, Washington, where he was soon arrested by Bellingham Police Department, for raping and murdering two women he had lured to a home for a house-sitting job. Bianchi attempted to set up an insanity defense, claiming that he had disso dissociative identity disorder and that a personality separate from himself committed the murders. Court psychologists, notably Dr. Martin Orney, observed Bianchi and found that he was faking. 
So Bianchi agreed to plead guilty and testify against Buono in exchange for leniency. Bianchi is serving a life sentence at the Washington State Pen Penitentiary in Walla Walla. Buono died of a heart attack on September 21st, 2002 at Calipatria State Prison in California, where he was serving a life sentence. So this one can also be considered controversial as it's actually not believed that he himself murdered anyone. He technically does not fit the profile for a serial killer as he never committed the crimes and he actively stayed away from the crime scenes. But in the history of famous killings, somehow his name has always popped up. Charles Manson was born in 1934 in Cincinnati, Ohio to a 15 year old mother. By the time he moved out to California, he was already a career criminal, having committed at least 10 serious offenses before his 21st birthday. He traveled to Los Angeles with his pregnant wife in a stolen car, which earned him another trip to prison for traveling across state lines in a stolen vehicle. His wife divorced him at this time after giving birth to their son. He was again released, but after crossing state lines again and starting a prostitution ring with his second wife, he was again sent to prison. He was released from prison in 1967 and moved from Los Angeles to Berkeley, where he began to form his cult, starting with his first member, a librarian at UC Berkeley. Manson soon began to attract large crowds of listeners and some dedicated followers. He targeted individuals for manipulation who were emotionally insecure and social outcasts. He attempted to reprogram their minds to submit totally to his will through the use of LSD and unconventional sexual practices that, was turn his, that would turn his followers into empty vessels that would accept anything he poured. By the end of his stay in the height in April 1968, he had attracted 20 or so followers. The core members of his following eventually included Charles Tex Watson, a musician and former actor, Bobby Beausoleil, a former musician and pornographic actor, Bruner, the UC Berkeley librarian, Susan Atkins, Patricia Krenwinkel, and Leslie Van Houten. Supervised by his parole officer, Roger Smith, Manson grew his family through drug use and prostitution without interference from the authorities. In early August 1969, some Manson family members committed murders in Los Angeles. The Manson family gained national notoriety after the murder of actress Sharon Tate and four others in her home on August 8th and 9th, 1969, and Len Leno and Rosemary LaBianca the next day. Tex Watson and three other members of the family committed the Tate LaBianca murders, allegedly under Manson's instructions. While it was later accepted at trial that Manson never expressly ordered the murders, his behavior was deemed to warrant a conviction of first degree murder and conspiracy to commit murder. Evidence pointed to Manson's obsession with inciting a race war by killing those he thought were pigs and he, his belief that this would show others how to do the same. Family members were also responsible for other assaults, thefts, crimes, and the attempted assassination of President Gerald Ford in Sacramento by Lynette Squeaky Fromm. The state of California tried Manson for the Tate and LaBianca murders, and Manson and his co-defendants were all sentenced to death in 1971. Charles Manson himself died in prison in 2017 from complications from colon cancer. So here are just some um, basic serial killer by the numbers statistics. So 65 is the percentage of serial killer victims who were approached and then drawn in by a killer's ruse or scam. Eight is the number of years women's killing careers last on average, according to a 2011 study by criminologists titled Lethal Ladies. In comparison, men's sprees tend to last only two years. 12 is the percentage of serial murderers who killed more than 10 victims between 1960 and 2006, according to an FBI study. Of the 92 killers the FBI included in its study, roughly 11 fit this category. 15 is the percentage of serial killer victims who are stabbed to death. 
more than 40% of serial killers choose a less intimate method of murder and opt to shoot their victims. 70 is the percentage of serial killers who only prey on and kill strangers. 21 is the percentage of serial killers who experience definite or suspected head injuries in the past. 81 is the percentage of serial killers active between 1960 and 2006 who are motivated to kill for sex according to an FBI study. Ted Bundy is well within this figure. 50 is the number of serial killers who are operating in the United States at any given time, according to the FBI's report, Serial Murder, Pathways for Investigations. Out of all the US states in the US, California has the highest number of serial homicide cases in the 20th century at 16% 16 of the national total. Maine has the lowest at none. The United States has the highest number of serial killers with 76% of the world's total. Europe comes in a distant second with 17%. And in 1987 alone, it was estimated that there were 189 serial killers operating based on the two or more definition. There's no generic profile for serial killer because they differ in so many ways, but there are a few things to consider. While one in 25 people are sociopaths, not all of those sociopaths turn out to be serial killers. However, it is proven that all serial killers are sociopaths. All serial killers have the belief that they can get away with murder, and regardless of their motives, a serial killer will ultimately kill because it gives them the satisfaction to do so. As you may have noticed, the vast majority of killers highlighted tonight operated during a certain time period. So why don't we hear about these types of murders all the time, like in the 70s and 80s? Well, there are a few reasons. There have obviously been huge strides in technological advances, like the invention of the cell phone, tablet, laptop, computer, etc. There has also been extensive forensic advances. There's a great deal more cultural and psychological progress today. For example, people are more conscious of issues dealing with race or gender and have increased empathy for these issues. And while this last one might seem crass and technically falls under the technology advances, it still should be said the availability of pornography for the average person. So do all of these factors mean there's a decline in serial killers? Perhaps. Or maybe there are fewer cases on record because the killers are better at concealing their crimes now. And remember, it's been estimated that the average person will walk past at least 36 serial killers in their lifetime. So remember that the next time you walk out of your door. And with that, our presentation is done. I hope everybody enjoyed it. And again, we are recording it so you can catch it at another time. And have a good night.